Let today's meeting of the Velshi Band Book Club commence. I'm joined now by Stephanie Land, author of the best-selling memoir, Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and a Mother's Will to Survive. The book, which was also the inspiration for the Emmy-nominated Netflix series, Made, tells Stephanie's story as a young single mother who makes a living by cleaning houses. The author, Barbara Ehrenreich, contributed the foreword for Made. And I'm also joined by Sarah Smarsh, author of Heartland, a National Book Award finalist. Heartland is part Sarah's memoir, part social analysis, and part cultural commentary. Terry. I want to welcome you both. Thank you for being uh, on the show. Stephanie, welcome back. Good to see you. I'm sort of fascinated. I mean, obviously, I'm fascinated by Barbara's work and, and both of your works uh, because it, it, it tells a story that so many millions of Americans live and yet isn't well covered. On the other hand, I'm surprised that it's a, it was a challenged or banned book. People, Stephanie, just don't want to hear this stuff about poverty and how difficult it is, it, it, as it is. It runs counter to a narrative we have in America that everybody can fix their situation and get out of poverty easily. It does. Uh, thank you, Ali, for having me on. And it's good to see you in person or virtually, Sarah. Um, I, I was honestly surprised that it was a banned book, too. Um, I... I didn't realize that and I kind of wondered if mine was. Um, but I, you know, I think people don't like to hear about um, how people use our government systems and our safety net programs to make ends meet. Um, because in a lot of people's minds, those are supposed to be temporary and not something that literally supplements the wages that people aren't earning because our minimum wage has been so low for the last 20 years. Let me ask you, Sarah, I, I want to I want to start with a quote uh, from Nickel and Dime that's been widely circulated since Barbara's passing a few weeks ago. The working poor, as they are approvingly termed, are in fact the major philanthropists of our society. They neglect their own children so that the children of others will be cared for. They live in substandard housing so that other homes will be shiny and perfect. They endure privation so that inflation will be low and stock prices high. To be a member of the working poor is to be an anonymous donor, a name benefactor to everyone else. Evaluate this for me. Uh, sounds right to me. <laughs> Having lived it and witnessed it, um, you know, of course, what uh, Barbara's doing there is flipping on its head the um, American myth that such people are mooching off of the system, um, that someone who is ne in need of some sort of assistance, um, a lot of people who uh, take benefits in this country, by the way, are working and just can't get by on the wages that they are afforded, which is what this book documents. And um, and so the, um, the myth uh, that's perpetuated in this country, um, which exalts uh, capitalism, is that um, um, such people just aren't working hard enough. They're lazy. If you can't make ends meet, there's something wrong with you. Um, and how dare you take my tax dollars to pay for your children's meal when, in fact, um, it, it's quite the opposite, that this group of people is being disproportionately exploited for their labor. And I would argue even to some extent their their taxes, if you look at just the, the percentage that they contribute in uh, con, uh, compared to their incomes. Stephanie, part of why uh, Barbara's books were challenged, or this book was challenged, was because it, 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 there's always a veiled or not so veiled attack on the capitalistic system. But she does talk about um, they live in substandard housing so that other homes will be shiny and perfect. That's actually a little bit of your story. Do you agree with her evaluation here? I do. Um, I, it's hard to see it that way when you're living it. Um, I, I didn't feel like a philanthropist <laughs> when I was uh, living in a moldy apartment and making sure that everybody's lives looked perfect on the outside um, for a living. Um, but it, it's it's very demeaning, um, that type of work. And when you're in it, all you feel is that you're kind of like a leech that's sucking the life out of society in some way, um, because that's just I, I felt that every single moment that I wasn't physically working. Sarah, I, both of you actually read, read this book and then read it uh, later in life. Does it land differently for you now, uh, Sarah, after sort of living and uh, the life that you've lived? lived? Sure. I think quickly to answer your question, I give you a little context for my first encounter with the book. Um, you know, I, I was raised among the working poor. I grew up on a wheat farm in Kansas and then um, ended up as a first generation college student and then in the very rarefied space of Columbia University as a graduate student. And one of my professors assigned the book. And so I was kind of sitting among, you know, students who didn't have firsthand experience of the the um, the world that Barbara was documenting. And, and I did reading it alongside um, my peers was quite surreal at that moment. 
and I felt very validated. I felt seen. I would say that, you know, years on, decades on, uh, the book does land differently. It's a different time. Um, you know, I, I would say that uh, our level of sophistication as a society and culture on, on all sorts of identities that intersect with class um, has, has evolved. Um, I think, too, that some readers have taken issue with, um, you know, Barbara's t temperament was, uh, you know, could be quite sharp. And, and that's one of the things that made her a brilliant intellect. Um, but it's um, it, it's not a softly written book, um, which is fine by me. There are points at which perhaps the judgments that she levies um, uh, strike me as potentially problematic now for a writer who came from a working class background mm -hmm. and, and then was writing as a middle class um, woman, if that makes sense. So she had ownership of the space, but yet all the same, she was sort of going into someone else's world by that point in her career, that sometimes feels a little bit problematic to me. Interesting, and w which wasn't the case for you, Stephanie. You, you weren't walking into someone else's world. You, were, you wrote about your experiences that were that horrible, right? So when, when Barbara's talking about taking these jobs in Key West or in a, at a Walmart in Minneapolis or uh, cleaning houses in Maine, y you were living that life. And in fact, the, the book and the TV series sort of go through the terror you felt when you purchased someone something and and the card didn't go through or you realized you were out of money in your bank account yeah in your introduction when um when you reminded me that her the end amount that she had per month was like 22 dollars for me that was sometimes kind of a lot <laughs> like i i often had 10 dollars, and if i had to buy new work clothes it was whatever i put toward my credit card that month on a minimum payment, it immediately went back into work um, or things that helped me clean my own house. Um, so I, you know, I, I think the book is um, is eye opening for a lot of people, uh, especially the time that it came out in 1996. Uh, I, I read it uh, or sometime around there. Um, I read it when when it first came out, because all of my barista friends were like, oh, my goodness, this person wrote about wait waitressing and it was amazing. And um, and then later on, when I read the book, um, as I was um, revising and editing made, I I learned that the whole entire book is basically about finding secure housing. And for me, that was just so normal in my life that I didn't even it didn't even occur to me that that's a unique situation for a lot of people. To a point that uh, Stephanie made a, a few moments ago, Sarah, I want to ask you, uh, throughout Nic uh, Nickel and Dime, there are references about Barbara and her co-workers being faced with bodily and psychologically harm. I want to talk about the psychological harm for a second. From page 115 of the book, uh, she writes, if you are treated as an untrustworthy person, a potential slacker, drug addict, or thief, you may begin to feel less trustworthy yourself. If you are constantly reminded of your lowly position in the social hierarchy, whether by individual managers or by a plethora of impersonal rules, you begin to accept that unfortunate status. Tell me about that. You nailed it. Um, you know, something that I tried to convey in my book, Heartland, is that class, which is a kind of woefully under-discussed aspect of, of the American experience, uh, because we pretend it doesn't exist here in this supposed meritocracy, um, one of the things that we don't articulate about it when we're attempting now to finally address it is that it's not just about money and dollar signs and um, the amount in a bank account and the resources that you can or can't access. It's the wear on one's um, mind, body, and soul. Um, um, that accumulates over a lifetime of looking at a paycheck with a low number on it in a society that correlates somehow one's worth and value with the number on that paycheck. So if you're constantly being told you, de you deserve little, um, then it can very much seep into um, seep into your your mind and, and heart that you yourself have little value, um, and that uh, and there are myriad ways in which society reinforces that sort of shame, um, and that, that's a big piece I think of what Aaron Reich was uh, addressing is is the shame of poverty, and that shame uh, has a psychological and and tangible effect on being able to pull yourself out of poverty. That's part of it. Uh, this conversation is not over. It's just 
my show is over. So uh, if I could just ask you both to uh, hang out there. Stephanie Land, the author of the New York Times bestselling memoir, Made. Sarah Smarsh is the author of the National Book Award finalist, Heartland. Uh, conversation's not stopping. There's much more to discuss. After the show, Stephanie, Sarah, and I will be joined by Dr. Andre Perry, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, for an extended edition of this Velshi Band Book Club meeting. Later this week, you'll be able to stream it all exclusively on Peacock.